It's your girl Valerie Adams. We are in Cape Town on our way to Robbins Island. Robbins Island is where Nelson Mandela was incarcerated. So we're on our way to jail. Clank, clank. Table top, table, table bay. Table bay. Sun okay. table bays. Sun table bay because we are at the table top mountain. This was the mountain that I met and had to go to the island as yesterday. Our first day we took the cable up on the table top mountain. You can see the mountain there. You see that that is the table. That's how they make the table top mountain. This bridge here. We will open all the way out when we pass through. We're in Cape Town, South Africa. There's a guy that will take over from me. 
when we get to the maximum security jail that was locked up on Robin Island. Oh. Oh. Who's a former prisoner. <coughs> and I don't want to rob you of that experience by talking about that jail. Yes? My time is going to come. You see, time in, in, in South Africa has a mandatory age of 65 years. The youngest former prisoner is 58. Oh. So you know, pretty soon, that story, that journey is going to come to an end. So my time of sharing that story will come pretty soon. In 1990, and one thing I, I, I need to point out is that the prisoner was a male of color. And when I say male of color, one of three groupings, colored, mm -hmm. Indian, or black. The prison authority was England. Or white. <laughs> and, and, I, and I'm very strategic in sharing this, and I'll try and explain this a little bit later. And, and, and in 1997, when I joined Robin Island, I must be honest, I had perceptions of Robin Island before I started working here. The one perception was Robin Island is an Alcatraz. One big building a jail. The second perception I had is, look, I'm not a former prisoner. When I say I'm not a former prisoner, it doesn't mean I wasn't arrested during those bitter days of apartheid. I was never found guilty and sentenced to a jail. So I don't know what prison was like. So I had to perceive prison based on the movies and the series you watch. You know, prison break oranges and your black perception. <laughs> In 1997, when I joined this organization, what did I meet? A former prisoner working for Robin Island. A former prison officer working for Robin Island. In other words, what you and I would perceive to be the enemy became colleagues. More importantly, they were living on Robin Island as neighbors. So understanding that, two perceptions were thrown through the window. It's not an Alcatraz because there are other buildings on the island. You'll see that. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the perception of prison was something totally different to what I expected. And I would like to take you on a sojourn of perceptions through this part of your journey, where I take you through 500 years of Robben Island, a place of banishment, a dumping ground, a place for the out of mind, the out of sight to society. And at the same time, who knows what we're going to see? <coughs> Penguins to Steenbach to Bontebach to tortoises to snakes. Uh, they roam around freely. They are not caged in in any way. Now, give an example just how the, the, the unique, ex une unexpected things that can happen. Myself and Claude the other day drove, drove down the road with a group of tourists and there was a long mold snake lying on the side of the road. Not poisonous, but nice and big, just enjoying the sun. And then we stopped and people took photographs and got up to take photographs and the snake decides to make its way into the vehicle. You know? no. No, no, no! I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> Our gang. Um, what did happen was the engine being at the back and then it the ended up in the engine yeah. compartment. Right. So we had to uh, get More someone TV. out to have the snake removed. So these are the, the weird things that could happen. But, but in the 26 years uh, that I've been working here, I've had an amazing uh, journey meeting some amazing people from heads of states to celebs to former prisoners 1997 nelson mandela and a few occasions after that and 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 i share this because um of what you shared with me earlier look but don't touch you know <laughs> so uh, this this story came in when i when i got onto a vehicle with 40 german speaking ladies 40 of them one of them had a happy 50th birthday sash on <coughs> Now, I didn't know they were from Germany, but I saw the birthday sash, one group, so obviously it was something, you know, the group decided to do for a 50th birthday. So, um, I get on, I introduced myself, you see, oh, this is Claude, by the way. Hello. What is the guy driving? And as you can see, sir, my name is Toya. So, I get on, I said to them, hello, I'm Toya. And this ladies gave me the weirdest look. And the one lady asked, are you Toya? I said, yes. She said, are you really Toya? I said, yeah, that's me. Now you must understand, I thought I'd become famous. <laughs> <laughs> Only to find out that Toya is a German word. 
For, for? for expensive. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there I'm standing at a pole telling 40 ladies, hello, I am. <laughs> Happy 50th birthday. And immediately I, I could see in their eyes velvet curtains, glitter <laughs> <laughs> balls. <laughs> By the gratuity I got, by the end of my tour, I think they expected something to be. I promise you that's not going to happen. But, <laughs> so we're good. We're good. Because when you go back to the 15, 1600s, man would have set foot where we are standing today. This used to be a sandy beach. And what they found was a barren piece of land, no buildings, no trees. But with the amount of seals found on this island, the name Robin Island was born. It's a Dutch word for seals. Oh, okay. And immediately, with looking at this piece of land, finding food and fresh water, many of the passing boats found this ideal to get supplies in terms of fresh water and food, instead of the unknown of the indigenous man of the Cape. 1652, the Dutch East Indian Company decides to take over the Cape. And with the indigenous um, uh, Khoisan being found there, there was also the perception that they were uncivilized, who had no clue on how to use the sea. That perception was based on an uninhabited piece of land seven miles away. And immediately they thought, if there's a problem, they can leave the prisoner here. By 1658, Ochumatu became the first prisoner left here. By 1659, he had built the raft and became the first successful escape. <laughs> <laughs> he escaped to Blauber, the first land point. But immediately you can see a history of a jail. We're going to see a green dome structure in a moment. It's on the far side of the prison that looks like a little mosque. But by the 1740s, the Dutch East Indian Company tried to safeguard the sea route to the East Indies and when Java as it was known back then, was taken over, the religion of Islam was introduced to this part of the world. Because holy Muslim men became the political exiles and prisoners that was brought here. 1800s, the British arrived. And then there was a different understanding because they saw that mountain on that side and thought, what's on the other side of that mountain? And ultimately they got there and they found a tribe living there. And they thought, oh, I like the land. And they said, can we have it? And obviously the answer was no. And they said, okay, let's take it. And ultimately it led to wars. These were known as the wars over land or the wars of disposition. And again, the army became the jail. Chief Makana, Chief Langali Balele, Chief Siolo. In other words, the further away from the Cape they moved, the more tribes they found and the more wars and, and more prisoners to Robben Island. Ooh. But we're going to now encounter a different Robben Island as we go through and away from the harbor. Do take note, the harbor was built Second World War. Important to mention that because by the Second World War, with the, uh, the Cape very much on the side of the Allies and the fear that Germany could attack the Cape with the Suez Canal <laughs> being the danger, and many of the Allied boats came and coming down the west of Africa, they would drown Table Mountain to the east of Africa, and there was a fear that Germany could attack. So fortifying Robben Island meant a harbor was needed. And with the harbor being built, bigger, build, bigger boats could dock here, and you will see the amount of buildings that went up purely by looking at the architecture. A lot of them look like military structures, oh. military uh, that talks about a military base Second World War. An airfield was laid out, guns were installed. We have guns on the island that had a shooting distance of over 20 miles. There are underground bomb shelters, spotting rooms, there are buildings up to 60 feet beneath us, tunnels connecting underground areas together. And so the island was used and fortified to a point that 3,000 soldiers could have been stationed. But these are some of the things I'm going to touch on again as we go along. But to, to, just to give an idea that the island had been a prison, for more than 500 years. But if all goes according to plan, I should have you in jail within <laughs> an hour. <laughs> Stage in my life that I saw nothing wrong with the party. Am I correct, sir? 
my, 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 my good friend sitting over there, would, mm. would you agree with me that it was a stage, even in your life, that you didn't really see? Let me put it this way. As the way, the way Apartheid was uh, structured, I thought that it was created by God that we must be the low-class citizens. I've seen that there is something wrong, but I didn't know where it was coming from. You know, because they did build up in a way whereby they have to make sure that even our minds, we think that is normal. Brainwashed. Yes, brainwashed. Till I reached an age of 12 years, when I realized that definitely something is wrong. Because other people, they can't live that way, that beautiful lifestyle, and we're living this lifestyle. Mm. It's true, but in other way. And, and, yeah. I'm, and I'm being paid, if you get what I mean. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what, what I need to also mention, and exactly what he just shared, there was a minister in parliament who had a portfolio as a minister of propaganda. Mm. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Everything we read, everything we heard, everything we saw on television was approved by the Minister of Propaganda. Mm -hmm. So, hence he's saying he thought it was the word of God mm -hmm. that he has to be at the lower end of the scale. I was made to believe, and I'm, and I'm not trying to paint a particular picture, I'm just trying to be as honest as I possibly can that black people were dirty. Mm. I was made to believe that if I see a black lady walking in my colored neighborhood, she, she is a domestic worker. And, and, and that is exactly what he said. Because the priest tells you that, your teacher tells you that, your government tells you that, you open up the newspaper, you read that, you switch on the radio, you, that's what you listen to. Can I, add, can I add, add something? That's why people like uh, Steve and Bandu Biko raise up and say black is beautiful. So they wanted to make sure that we must love ourselves the way we are. And God didn't make a mistake mm -hmm. to create us being black, mm -hmm. giving us this black color. So they came up and say, believe in yourself. Trust yourself. You can. You are strong as any other human being mm -hmm. in this world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. It's, 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 it is the changing of the mindset that I'm trying to get at that made people see things differently, believe things differently. And I'll. And and and. The sad reality is that there are still tendencies of that thinking alive in the way of thinking of people. So the answer is, is racism alive in South Africa? Yes. Up here. Not in law. Not in law, but in here. I'll give an example. I saw my mom ironing her hair. Like you iron a shirt? Brown paper and a hot iron. Straight to the ground. And you know why? You see, apartheid was not based, or you, racially, you were not classified based on mom or dad, as you would perceive. Mom, dad, black, kid black. Mom, dad, white, kid white. Age 16, you had to apply for your identification document. At this age of 16, they racially classify you into one form. And then this gentleman comes along. He's too dark to be colored, too light to be black. Mm -hmm. So where does he fit in? So they test you by putting a pen into your hair. Oh, if it falls out, when you shake it, you are colored. If it gets stuck, you are black. Oh. Yes, it's true. Yes, it is true. Oh, my God. Now, 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 keep in mind, we are talking about the pure breed. Do not tempt the pure breed. Blonde hair, blue eye. Mindset. You know where that comes from? And what happens if you had no hair? The measurement, the measurement of the thickness of your upper lip or the width of your nose. So what I'm trying to share is what the stupidity of apartheid was like. But classified as the Bantu or the black person, you were governed by a law called the pass law. 
Now, this was a law that restricted the movement of black people within this country to a point. There was a document that you walked around with every time you leave your house that gives you the right to be where you are at that particular time. But if you contravene the document, if you don't have it in your possession, you ended up in prison anything between three to six months without a trial. 1959. A new political movement was formed called the Pan-Africanist Congress. The co-founder member of this movement was a man by the name of Robert Mangaliso Sabukwe. He calls on every black person to deliberately contravene this law, to leave the document at home, to go to the nearest police station, inform the police you don't have the document, wow. you've contravened the law demand the rest he said let us find out if the country will have enough prison space to house everyone if we all contravene on one day and at the same time 21st of march 1960 the law was defined they went to the police stations informed the police they don't have the documents and in front of one police station in a township called Shawful, the police shot and killed 69 people. Oh, yes, yes. The world got to know this day as the day of the Shawful massacre. Yes, yes. The unknown factor of this day was Robert Sabukwe's arrest. Charged with incitement, found guilty, received a maximum sentence, and that was three years. He served it out in January. <coughs> 1960 was also a critical year where the apartheid government was concerned. They saw what could happen if the masses should unite and stand up. So what they did, they started to instill fear, change legislation. <coughs> Robben Island became the prison, you know it today. <coughs> but in 1963, trying to suppress this uprising, the leader of the most powerful movement is about to walk out of prison. An entire parliament convenes, discusses Robert Sabukwe, passes the Sabukwe clause, allowing the state to re-arrest and place under house arrest. And that is where the house with the water tank comes in. Confined to an area, please note those grid iron gate structures, they were not there. I'll talk about it in a moment. Confined to this fencing area, no one is allowed to talk to him and is allowed to talk to no one. Total isolation, no one to talk to besides himself. This is the interesting part. Sorry, Troy. Uh, excuse me, folks. <coughs> For people who were on bus number two yesterday, do you remember that you, I did touch on this? Yes. Yes, because there was a question mm -hmm. that came to me. Why Mr. Mandela was so popular uh, more than any other political prison? Mm -hmm. You know? By the way, by the way, yes. I, I want to <laughs> not rectify you. Yes. But I need to clarify one thing. Yes. Nelson Mandela was not a political prisoner. Yeah. He, wasn't. Mm -hmm. he wasn't. No, 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 no. He was, but he wasn't. The law didn't classify him as a political yeah. prisoner. I'll explain that in a moment. Yeah. Can I finish up with this? Sure. Yeah. Then I said to, to my people, let me tell you, and I knew somebody was asking me, knew something about South Africa and politics, a little bit about politics or more. And I said, if you remember, Robert, uh, no, Stephen Bandubiko, and everybody rose up a hand and said, yes, we know about him. And I said, there's somebody that you don't know much about him. His name is Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe. Then you'll hear more when you get to Robin Island tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Todd. Now you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> You couldn't tell me that before we got here. I prepare myself for. But the, the, the reality of the conversation we are having is that he was now seen as the only political prisoner by law. And by law, what, meant, what that meant was certain privileges that had to be granted. Like he could sleep on a bed, wears on clothes, allowed books, newspapers, a radio to listen to. The other prisoners, and you will learn about their prison conditions a bit later. He walked around freely. Whenever he wanted to, he could come out of that house and walk around. He can go to bed, sleep whenever he wanted to. But no one to talk to besides himself. And initially he was told to be kept here for one year. He ended up on Robin Island for six. Oh. Can you say that again, please? 
He was he was supposed to be imprisoned on Robben Island under this particular clause for only one year. But he was kept here for six. He was diagnosed with lung cancer. Fearing that the only political prisoner in South Africa could die on this island is the reason why he ended up in a township 12 hours away from Cape Town called Khadishiwe, where he lived and, uh, in a house with his wife and his, and his family. He was allowed to interact with that people of that community, but they told him, you talk to three people or more at the same time constitutes an illegal gathering. You think he had a wife and four kids? No. Yeah. He died in 1978 at the age of 53, still under house it is. But England, do you know what is interesting? Is that in 2008, Nelson Mandela was officially removed from the terrorist watch list in the US. Oh. Yeah. Tell you I'm gonna drop the jaws. <laughs> and why? Because everyone kept in that jail had broken the law of this country and they were criminal and they were classified as terrorists. Oh. And that is why he ended up on a terrorist watch list in the US up until 2008. I think the surprising part, he was on that list in the first place. Remember, remember Ronald Reagan? Yes. Remember the, the guy sitting at United Nations under Ronald Reagan called Dick Cheney? Yes. Did you know he voted for Mandela to remain in jail? Yes. They vetoed the call for Mandela's release. The question is why? Yeah. I'll talk about that a bit later. Wow. The other buildings around that house, built much later, Rottweiler's German Shepherd police type dogs became part of the narrative where security was concerned. But this is long after Robert Sabuka was taken off, and that is when the kennels was built to house the dogs. So roughly 1974, 75, um, the kennels were built for these dogs that was used in and around the prison complex. But um, sorry if I took you on a long road, I know it's very hot and bold, but I hope that context I was trying to put this man in helps to understand the space a little bit better. Uh, keep in mind, he would be the Malcolm X of South Africa. Hi guys, this is Valerie Adams. I'm here with Alonzo Cartledge, the president and CEO of Our Gang Travel. How are you doing, Lolo? I was doing okay till you start patting me on my back every word you said. But I thought you, I was trying to wake you up. I thought you were asleep. Oh, oh, oh okay. All right. She's smiling. Night night. Eliza hasn't had a sleep since what? 1972. <laughs> it, it, it was a stormy it, Wednesday. Know, it, it's just hard to come behind this woman. I don't know oh, what night, it is. Night, oh, night, night, long, long. Long, yeah, long, 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 I, I, night. I told her 30 years ago she should have been a comedian. <laughs> you know, <laughs> only, who was in Shasta is the only one took my recommendation. <laughs> you didn't. <laughs> so we shout you out, Shasta. Hey, 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 hey. Yeah. So we are here on Robbins Island, and wow, we just had an amazing conversation with our tour guide telling us uh, about this island that we're on that is just unbelievable. So we videotaped it, so you all will see that as well as um, us moving around throughout this island today. It's, it's disheartening when you learn about all of the efforts that were made to keep our people down, to, to keep us ignorant, and just to keep us incarcerated. So we are learning about about the people that have gone before us, Nelson Mandela and those others that were on this island because of our color of our skin. It's just amazing that we all went through through um, our history. So each one teach one, right? And as I always say, travel is the best education you can get. Mm -hmm. Because whatever somebody tell you is so far removed mm. for what it really is. This is true. And you haven't seen the world until, until we show, show it, it to you. you. Yeah. So let's look. Huh? <laughs> Love you, Lo. <laughs>
This is where Nelson Mandela and many others were incarcerated, where they fought for our freedom, fought for the freedom of their people. Um, we've just had an amazing morning. Uh, we took the boat over from Cape Town to this island. When the apartheid government realized the major fear England and U.S. had, <coughs> they adopted, they jumped on that fear wagon. And you know what was that fear? Communism. <laughs> and they called everyone who stood up against them as a communist. Hence, the terrorists watched us. Nelson Mandela was found on. Hence, Margaret Thatcher called Nelson Mandela a self-confessed terrorist. And let's fast forward. Yes, there were many people that did not buy South African fruits and wines. There were many marches and demonstrations against the apartheid government all over the world. But as sanctions was crippling the economy of South Africa, Canada, for example, one of the first countries to implement sanctions, you know, and many other Scandinavian countries implemented sanctions. But let's get to the end of the Cold War, the fall of the Berlin Wall. And what you do find is that the apartheid government realized that the backing they had was no longer there. And immediately they approached the political movements and said, guys, we need to talk. And they said, yeah, but how do you negotiate with a prisoner in a jail? Release all political prisoners, all political activists unconditionally. And then we can sit down and talk. October 1989, they agreed that all political activists would be released. And they did ask for time. They said, give us some time, and they agreed that by the end of April 1991, there'll be no more political activists within this country. Thank you. The 14th of October, to be exact, the first group of political activists were released. The Livonia Trilist as a winner. Nelson Mandela in 1990, as you remember, and every other day, pockets of prisoners was released, not only from Robben Island, but in many other jails in this country. 27th April 1991, the negotiations started. This led to the elections of 1994. Nelson Mandela became president. Apartheid came to an end. And South Africa ends up with the most progressive constitution in the world. 1995, critical year. Critical. South Africa wins a right to World Cup. Remember. And, and these emotions I'm trying to also bring into the story. But the apartheid government says, but the guys were locked up, came out of jail, far more prepared for the negotiations than what we expected them to be. Which is odd if you think about it. What did they do? They threw all political activists basically into one prison. In other words, they threw cultures, languages, religions, different political movements together. Then they decided to keep the masterminds, the leaders, in one section of the prison. And what did you think they were going to talk about? We have one of the most progressive constitutions in the world. It was about preparing for freedom and not waiting for freedom. It was about turning the disadvantage of prison into their own advantage. Shouldn't we rather say, welcome to the first democratic parliament of this country and not Robin Island the prison? Yeah, yeah. But that freedom that they talked about, that they planned for, was a dream for many as well. A dream because if you're in prison after 10 years and 15 years, you start questioning whether or not you will see freedom. But that dream became the reality. 1994 did happen. Apartheid did come to an end. And imagine the emotion when 1,200, 1,200 former prisoners came back to Rob Island on the 11th of February, 1995. Wow. And they stood in the quarry behind me. I promise you I'm going to give you a much better view of the space when my colleague in front moves off. But 1,200 of them stood in the space behind me. And that day, 11th of February, 1995, it was members of parliament standing here. It was minister, deputy minister. It was Nelson Mandela, president of South Africa, standing there. I don't think I can put emotions into words, but I would imagine. But something unique happened as the, the reunion was concluded. Mr. Mandela, president, was due to walk out. And as he did, greeted his comrades. But he picks up a stone. 
And with a stone in hand, he stops at the entrance, stood for a moment, and laid it down. And without a question, the rest followed. And if you look carefully behind me, there's a pile of stones at the, at the entrance. And each and every stone is a mark of a prisoner that was here at that reunion. And what it also shows you and I, how cultures, languages, religions, different political minds came into one space fighting one enemy. Irrespective of religion, political alliance, there was one enemy that brought you here called the party. And that is our monument of the triumph of the human spirit of adversity, the triumph of the human spirit of all odds. So, I want to leave you with a thought. And it's a thought I'd like to share, but let me first give you that opportunity to take a few photographs. And then, and then we make our way to the prison, I would like to share that thought with you. I haven't asked if I could identify Mr. Mandela's stone. I said yes, it's the first one. I've been asked some amazing questions. Like the one that asked, am I sure that this is an island? No, we're not getting up. We're not getting up. I was asked if I'm sure that this is, uh, this is really an island. No, no, we're not getting up. When a kid grows up not looking at the color of his skin or religion, where does it go wrong? And, and, and I believe we have a role to play where it goes wrong or to change the mindset. So my part of sharing history is also to try and make us think a bit differently. Nelson Mandela once said, never, never, and never again should it be that this beautiful land should ever experience oppression by one over another. I would like to quote another guy called Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> Who once said, once the power of love overtakes the love for power, only then can this world know peace. So here's a thought. Imagine every three-year-old in this world grow up with that narrative. Imagine where our world can be pretty soon. And, and for me, that's Robin Island. Like I said, the journey of perceptions. And I hope I'm leaving you with a thought. I hope I'm leaving you with something to debate, discuss, not only tonight, but tomorrow and the next day. And why I share this is because we are a unique space. A space of critical debates, a space of lifelong learning, a space where Minds came together and I think it will happen. So thank you for allowing me to share a little bit of Robin Island with you. I really hope this part of your journey was informative, interesting, thought-provoking, and I hope you enjoyed it. I did try to make you look deliberate. Because so because so many people have told us the journey of that prison is heavy and if it is. I hope I was able to balance the tour out by looking at the lighter side of the other issue. Now I say goodbye to you, myself and my colleague over here part ways with you from this point. Because at the end of the journey of the prison, you won't find yourself on the vehicle. We don't drive you a few hundred yards to the harbor. You embark on a walk. What you might not realize is the walk you take is a walk that every prisoner took the day when they were released. You're gonna to get to, the, to Cape Town at about one o'clock this afternoon and I promise you, when you get off the boat, you're going to think what's for lunch. <laughs> Point in case. <laughs> what, what, what's your next stop after this? Lunch. Lunch, lunch. reservations. You're already thinking of it, uh, you know, if you get my meaning. 
Mr. Ahmed Katrada was in prison, was sentenced to 26 years. He, was, he spent 26 years in jail. He said in many, many occasions he thought life was life, he was going to die in jail. And then 13th October 1989, they came to him and said, we just received a fax, you're going home tomorrow morning. For 26 years, was this was the moment he dreamt he talked about. That fax finally came. His first question was, what the hell is the fax? <laughs> In other words, in other words, how they walked that road, <coughs> got onto a boat, but journeyed into the future. Something to think about once again. Twenty-four hours too long. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm very pleased to have you. My name is Sipo. Sipo. Yes. H is silent. S I P H O. Sipo. Yes. As a word, it simply means gift. My one and only sister, together with my mom, were the ones who gave me the strongest support after being arrested. I was here for five years. Ooh arrested as a member of African National Congress. They will come and visit me three times a year. Coming from Durban, they will take a 4,000 kilometer round trip by train. Wow. Just, just to spend, each one of them spending 30 minutes with me at the harbor. Oh, oh wow. They will do that three times. It was always feeling very, very special. You knew we are really loved without conditions by these mm. guys. And then before I came here, I attended the court case for a few months. My mom was a working mom. My sister was already training to be a teacher. But they will come to the court at least twice a week just to give me that much needed support. And then uh, before I was taken to court, having been arrested by security police under Internal Security Act, where you were not even allowed to see a lawyer. Wow. Mm -hmm. They were allowed to keep you in solitary confinement for a minimum of six months. So I ended up spending six months and two weeks in solitary confinement. They will not even know your whereabouts. Where I have been kept was also a secret. But my sister and my mom, after many weeks of being arrested, they kept on going to the headquarters of the security police in my hometown, Debe, demanding that they want to see me, even though they knew, according to Internal Security Act, is not allowed. But they went there to put a lot of pressure on a number of days. Eventually, the security police compromised. They drove them to where I was being kept, blindfolded, mm. and then so that they cannot see the route. And then once, once they were there, they were told, don't even try and shout at him. Don't even try to make him aware that you are here. Oh. They were positioned a few meters from my cell in the corridor. So one morning, the security police opened the two gates leading to the cell door. At the door, instead of talking, they stepped back towards the corridor, which really surprised me. Why they are standing at the corridor? and then asking me small questions. How are you? How did you sleep? How was your breakfast? And so on. They simply wanted them to, hear to yeah. keep me talking so mm -hmm. that my sister and my mom, they can hear my voice. They were satisfied that at least I'm still alive. At least I'm still alive. So they never bothered them after that.
These are the beds they slept in. This is the bathroom. This is the. I don't know if they're toys, but this is the bathroom in the shower. In the single cells, prisoners were using buckets as toilets. When you are locked in your single cells from half past four in the afternoon to six o'clock the next morning, you use your bucket as your toilet. We go forward, there is a room. This is Mandela's cell. I've been here in camp. You can get a cap with his cell tall on this is South Africa. Okay, I'll look at that. Yeah. The guards make a recommendation that he be taken to a mainland hospital. This way, this way. On the uh the meal that they had, I saw up on the board where they had two different types of meals. Did they? Did they well, okay. when it comes to the meals, when I was around, in the morning, you'll get corn porridge with tea or coffee. Half past 11, you will get four slices of bread. It was called Puzamanda. It will come in the form of yellow powder. Take a scoop, you mix it with water and drink. Little nutrition there. And then the last meal of the day. Sometimes it's the same corn porridge as a staple diet. Sometimes it's rice mixed with crushed corn. <coughs> 
but served with served with fish powder and then your second best for Asians and people of mixed racial background and then your worst diet third category for black guys like myself is what year is going in here? I came here in 1984 December doing a five year sentence I left 1989 Now when as part of punishment they will starve you by giving you very little as food is part of punishment and then you'll be locked in your cell 23 hours every day, 30 minutes out of your cells in the morning to wash yourself and wash the bucket that you use as your toilet. After 30 minutes locked in your cell. Late afternoon, same routine, they take you out for about 30 minutes. Otherwise, 23 hours in your cell. And then for other things that you have seen as more serious, like attempting to escape, or physically fighting the guards, or found in possession of political literature. There used to be lots of political literature in this prison. The leaders staying in these single cells were always writing lots of political literature. So that in the big cells, after lockup, we do our political education. That was our program all the time. But sometimes you are found in possession of political literature, maybe for the third time, fourth time. They say, now we take the guy to the prison court. The prison court will give you an additional sentence for those things. It might be six months more, two years more, one year more, that kind of thing. So do you have any flashbacks? Like when you, you do, you do. Wow. You do. You do. You do. I even started cancelling like uh, 2017. Yeah, just a bit of counseling. Now, did you get any therapy or anything where, when you were released from here? Was there any? No! Every time we're still under apartheid, you are just released, you continue with your fight against apartheid. Yeah. It was like that. So, do you still hold, you have any resentments? Have you, have you made peace with this? Have you, have you forgiven? I think I have made peace with the past in some way. But, of course, the security police, they tortured me. Yes. I don't think I will ever forgive them. Worse, they even killed a comrade right here next to us. In fact, we are still pursuing that case to, take, to be taken to the courts. We are still pursuing it. It can go to the courts in the near future. Yeah.